Hi, I'm Rustin Leno. I'm going to take you through module four of this course. Module four is on specification and verification of code. So the emphasis is going to be how do you specify and verify pieces of code that we write in an, in an editor? How do you make sure that the code that you're writing uh, is going to work? Software development is, is expensive as we know it. And there are many things that, that have to come together if you want to increase the quality of that code to do the verification. Um, to do that, you first of all need specifications. If you don't have specifications, if you don't know what your code is going to do, it's very difficult to say whether or not it's doing the right thing. Uh, if you want to go all the way to do formal verification, then you also need proofs. Proofs that say that your code really does meet the specifications that you've written down. Uh, to do the proofs, you could imagine doing them uh, small proofs by hand, but that's, uh, that's very tedious and error prone by itself. So therefore, uh, you use tools. Uh, tools that are mechanical program, um, mechanical program verifiers or um, program, um, uh, program verifiers. Um, in some cases, some interactive proof assistants. Uh, to run the tools and to write the specifications and to do the proofs, you need to have expertise and developing in that expertise takes time. So this course is only a um, short beginning of, of that. So give yourself time, uh, plenty of practice, think in terms of the, uh, the concepts that you're learning here. So whatever you do, even if you don't end up writing formally verified software, uh, that is, if you write software that is not formally verified, you still have to reason about that software. That is, you still have to think about, does it work or not? Uh, and if you think about it in your head, you're probably going to miss many cases. But if you, um, if you have the right kind of thinking, you can get there quicker. So the whole process of learning how to verify and specify code is a thinking process as well. And the tools help you during that thinking process. So if you learn that thinking process, even if you're in a context where you're not doing formal verification of code, you will be a much better software engineer. So I just wanted to highlight a few projects that have been done in the in academic circles for verifying software that has gone well beyond uh, other other means of uh, assuring quality and these uh, there are many of them but uh, here are some that have been um, uh, milestones the paris metro system uh, in uh, the line 14 the brake system of that was verified in a system called b uh, the sel sel sel4 microkernel uh, was verified uh, that was a large effort and very impressive uh, in the end it comes to about 10,000 lines of c code which you might think, well, I could write that in, in, a, in a week. Well, uh, getting it to work is, uh, is harder than that. And um, having uh, the microkernel, which is the foundation of, of the things that you do on the operating system, having that verified is a very well-placed um, investment. The CompCert uh, C compiler uh, is another example. If you, um, uh, if you reason about your code in your source language and you think that it's correct, you would also like to hope that the compiler is correct, and that's what this project did. The, of course, there are a lot of other things that can go wrong as well. Uh, the hardware can fail, the user can do something wrong, uh, there can be gamma rays that interfere with your execution, all sorts of things. But when the programmer thinks about one piece of code, the programmer thinks at that level of abstraction, and that's where we're trying to verify the code. So if you then um, want to verify more parts of a system, like the compiler or hardware, um, uh, other components, uh, those can be verified as well, but that may be not it's not part of the same task as the program text that you have in front of you. So when you're faced with those tasks, you verify those if, if that's where you, you'd like to go. There have also been um, some projects using the Daphne system that have been verified, and Daphne is what I will use in this course to, to show you the, the concepts of, um, of how, to, uh, how to specify and verify code. So something that all of these projects have in common um, was that they were developed with verification in mind from the beginning. It's very difficult to verify code uh, that has already been written, legacy code. Um, so what researchers have found when they try to verify code is that if you write the code with the verification in mind, with the specifications and the tools in mind from the beginning, then you stand the chance at, at doing this and getting that higher quality of, of software. 
So um, I will um, take you through, uh, I will use Daphne as I said as a tool and I will take you through uh, pre and post conditions and in the, in the next uh, few lectures uh, I will talk a lot about the invariants as well. Daphne is a programming language that has uh, common imperative features like in, in Java and C Sharp. It also has functional features uh, like in languages like ML or Haskell. And uh, it also has uh, specification support like uh, languages like Eiffel or like the Java modeling language, which works together with, uh, with Java or the ACSL um, specification language for, uh, for C programs that the Frama C tools uh, are using. Um, <clears throat> uh, part of that specification support is also uh, support for writing proofs manually or interactively with the uh, with the system, and uh, uh, we will not need to to apply those in um, uh, for the simple things that we're going to do in the, in this class. So, um, Daphne can be used in uh, in the web browser at this URL here, uh, riseforfun.com/daphne. Uh, that's the easiest way to get started because you don't need uh, any installation. Um, but when you use the tool a little bit more, you will find that there, there are many universities in the world that are using Daphne and the, uh, you're competing with them for, for CPU time. Uh, also, it's, it gives you a nicer experience if you try it yourself in the, um, on your own computer. So there are, there's a version for Visual Studio, which is the one that I will use. There's a version for Emacs for any platform, and there's a version for VS Code for any platform. And if you're just getting started and don't have those, I would uh, recommend that you take a look at the VS Code, which is um, easy to, to set up and get started with. But try any one of those. Okay, so here we go. We're going to start with writing some very simple programs so that you get to see how Daphne works and we're going to write pre and post conditions. All right, here we are in the Visual Studio editor and I'm running Daphne. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a simple program to uh, triple uh, a parameter. The way that you would write that in Daphne is you declare the method using the method keyword. I'm having, uh, I give the name triple to this method and it's going to take one parameter, uh, one in parameter. Then to have out parameters, uh, I will also write, uh, I will declare them as well. And the out parameters get named uh, just like the in parameters do. So unlike some languages where there is zero or one return values from a method, in Daphne you can have as many as you'd like and you declare them and you give them names. Now, the next thing that's different in Daphne is that Daphne has specifications. So we will write a post condition, which is introduced with the ensures keyword. So I'm going to say that this method is going to ensure upon termination that R is equal to three times X. That's a simple example. You can see that the expressions uh, are C-like or Java-like or C-sharp-like. Okay, so with that specification, let's write the method. So we do that by introducing a body of the method. You can see that as soon as we do that, we get some sort of complaint, and the complaint here is that the post condition might not hold. Of course, we have not even started writing this program text, so uh, with an empty body, uh, it's not surprising that the post condition does not hold. So let's do something interesting um, for such a simple example. Let's set introduce y as a, globe, as a local variable and set it to two times the input. And then we will set the output variable r to x plus y. That's one way of achieving uh, the output. And you can see we were getting no complaints here. If, on the other hand, I had made some sort of mistake and written something uh, incorrect in the program, I will get uh, an error that uh, in this case here it's complaining about uh, that the uh, post condition does not hold. So if you look in the margin, you can see uh, Daphne running. So um, when an orange bar appears, that means that we have modified something that uh, has not yet been sent to the verifier, and you will see it here soon. Uh, when it turns purple for just a, a fraction of a second, that's when the verifier is thinking. So when the margin is clear of the orange and purple uh, lines, uh, that means that the verifier uh, is done thinking. And in particular, since we don't see any errors here, that means that the program is correct according to its specifications. You can also turn on the error windows to, um, to see a list of all of the, the errors. Let's do something similar. Um, let's do another method and call it double. 
and double will uh, take uh, the same in parameter and out parameter and its post con condition is going to be that, that it's going to return twice x. Now let's see how we can use the specification. So in triple, instead of setting y to two times x, we can call the double method, as you would expect, and that uh, also satisfies the verifier. And note that the verifier is happy with this, even though we have not yet written the code for double. This is an important point. It says that when you reason about a method call, you reason in terms of it, the specifications and the specifications alone. It is as if you don't see the code at all. So even if double had some code, it's you reason about the call in terms of the specification. Uh, that's nice because it means that the this implementation of a method is protected against callers. Uh, so the implementation is free to make its own decisions about certain things, just as long as it lives up to the specification. That's a very important concept in software engineering. Uh, it has a disadvantage as well though, and that means that everything needs to be part of the specification. So if you have some uh, private method that you might think uh, sort of belongs to the, to the caller, uh, then you still have to have a specification. There are different ways around that, but in, in Daphne and the way that we will use it, uh, methods are always reasoned about in terms of the specifications. So we say that they are transparent as opposed to opaque. Sorry, the other way around that they're opaque, not transparent. Okay, let's, um, let's uh, uh, implement this double method. And here I will just uh, do something simple like that. Uh, let's change the method to, instead of saying that it's going to return something that is exactly equal to two times x, I will say that it returns, the specification says that it returns something that is greater than or equal to, x, to two times x. In this case, the specification, the implementation still produces uh, a value that is exactly equal to two times x. But as you can see in triple, we're not able to take advantage of that fact. It complains here that it's not able to, to verify uh, the post condition of triple. And again, that is because this is what the verifier sees. It does not look inside double. And of course, this also now gives us the freedom to, um, to change what double does, for example, by uh, returning something slightly larger. If we wanted to change triple so that it could work with this specification of double, we, um, we could, for example, change it to, to that. And now you can see that that, that also works. Um, if that's not the, the specification that we are willing to have for triple, then of course we have another problem. We need to negotiate with whoever wrote double or we have to <coughs> uh, do something different. We cannot call double perhaps. All right, well, I've now shown you post conditions. A post condition is a condition that the implementation of a method needs to establish and therefore the caller can assume upon return that the post condition does hold. Now I'm going to introduce a precondition it's just the, the dual. It says it's a condition that the caller must establish before it's allowed to invoke the method. And it's therefore a condition that you can assume inside the implementation of the, of the method. So I will add a precondition to double, which is uh, to say that its input should be at least zero. You can see that we immediately get an, an error reported at the call site of this method now because the call sites have to establish the precondition. So this is a very important concept in software engineering that you have a precondition and you're saying what you expect of your callers, under which circumstances uh, a piece of code is allowed to call your routine. Um, so uh, how can we make triple work? Well, one way to make triple work is that we could make triple itself take a precondition, maybe the same one, and then of course it would work. But we could also change the code of triple so that triple can work with any integer, uh, any given integer, even though double restricts what, what it's allowed to take as an input. So if it so happens that x is a non-negative integer to begin with, then we can do what we did before. If not, we will do something different. And here I propose, well, let's call double with minus x. So we know from the, the conditional test that we're doing that in the then branch, x is at least zero. And in the else branch, we know therefore that x is strictly negative. So when we negate that, we get something that's positive, uh, strictly positive in fact. And that is something that we're allowed to call double on. But of course, now uh, the result we get 
is that the result, which is going to be stored in y, is at least two times mi minus x. So how can we then uh, get out of this? Well, let's try the following. What about, uh, we might think, well, we just negated it, so if we negate the doubling of it, uh, then everything should be fine. But it isn't. This might be something that you would do if you were writing the code and you don't think too hard about it and, the, and now you put it in there and now you start running your test suite and you realize it doesn't actually work. Or maybe it works for what you tried in the test suite because the method actually returns uh, exactly uh, 2 times x, in which case this would be fine. We can check that here if we'd like like that. But that's not what the, what the method says. The specification says that it returns something that is at least that. So therefore we need to think a little bit more here and I'll just do something. For example, uh, that would, would be okay. Uh, and if you're surprised uh, that the plus might work there, I invite you to think a little bit more. Um, okay, so uh, let me show you another small example that will lead into the assignment. Uh, so what I will write is a method sum max, which will take two inputs this time and it will have two outputs. Uh, I'll call them S and M. And the post condition in this case is going to be that S is the sum of the two inputs. And I will write another post condition as well. To write another one, I could conjoin it with an AND, uh, as you would expect. But in this case, I think it looks a little bit prettier to write it as a separate, um, a separate line, a separate post condition. You can do either. Uh, so I will say that M is going to be the max of X and Y. Well, what does that mean? It means that M is at least as big as X and M is at least as large uh, as Y as well. Well, that's not all. Um, the, um, that's only a partial specification of what max is, uh, what the max of two numbers is. We would also like to make sure that it isn't any bigger than, um, than, it, than necessary. In fact, we'd like the max to be one of the two inputs. So I will write one more uh, post condition and I will say that M is either equal to X or M is equal to Y. Okay, how are we going to write this method? Well, uh, simple, just uh, add X and Y and put the result in S. And then for uh, the max, well, we have to compare the two inputs. So I'll compare X and Y. And if, um, let's see here, if Y is the larger one, well then take that one. And if X is the larger one, then take that one. And there it is, okay. So now the exercise, the assignment that I will give you is, I will write the um, one more method signature. I will call it sum max backwards. It will take uh, two um, oops. It will take two parameters, but let me call them S and M, S in the out parameters of sum max, and it will have two output parameters. And let me name them x and y, just like the input parameters of sum max. The specification that I will use is going to be the very same post condition as sum max. But now, uh, notice that here we're giving S and M and we're supposed to produce X and Y. So we're doing it in the, uh, in the backwards order, if you will. That is, we're computing uh, X and Y from a given S and M. Okay, so your assignment is to write the, um, write the implementation of sum max backwards. And you will find, I will give you as a hint, you will find that you cannot always do that. So. To do this, you need to introduce a precondition. And the precondition, you'd like to be one that makes it possible for you to implement a method, but you don't want it to be so strong that, uh, that it, will be, it, it will be impossible for a caller to call you. Have fun with that exercise. Program safely.